Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day. Lord, that as a family, even though we have lost a friend, that such a short time was right here being a blessing to us. Lord, we thank you that we are people of faith and people that do not grieve as those that do not have hope. But Lord, again, we just thank you that, that, um, that you have watched over this congregation. Now we ask a special blessing upon this message. Father, I submit myself to you. I ask your help that your word and only your word will come through. This, this old filter of mine, Lord, may you cleanse me and make me capable of handling such a precious truth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Excuse me. While I'm... Amen. Now, I would ask a question, but I think you would know the answer pretty quick because I titled the message. But the question would be, what was the first thing that God said after uh, the man and the woman, Adam and Eve, sinned in the garden? What was the first thing he said? I'll give you a hint. It's the name of the message. Yes. Um, please look, turn with me or look up on the screen. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. Now this is after they, they had ate the fruit and that they sinned and their eyes their eyes were opened and then beginning in verse 8 they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man, and he said to him, Where are you? Where are you? He said, I, he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. These are the words of God for the people of God. Isn't that amazing how much of human nature is revealed in that one passage? But the most devastating thing, of, and this is what we call the original sin, first the origin or the beginning of sin, the devastating thing about it is that it separated humankind from God. God knew where they were. But come, here comes the question, where are you? Think about when it says that they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. I wonder what that was like when he would come and he would walk with them. But they heard the sound and then they hid themselves. And so here comes that haunting question. Where are you? And then they said, well, we, we heard your sound and we hid ourselves. And then, then out comes the, 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 when, when he questions Adam and the first thing out of his mouth, the woman. That, and it's accusatory against God. The woman that you made for me, she gave me the fruit and I ate. Then, then he asks the woman, what, what's this that you've done? The serpent deceived me. Oh, man. And then on it goes. But everything, all of our sin nature, everything about us 
can pretty much be seen in that one passage. A, 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 a kin um, scripture to that is one that I put in your bulletin in what I call the sermon to go box. These are little scriptures that I might and might not mention. But this was in the next chapter, and this is right after Abel, I mean, how Cain rose up in jealousy and he killed his brother Abel. And so right after that, in verse 9, it says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Think of the viciousness of that. Because Abel was a keeper of flocks. Think of the sarcasm in that term. Am I my brother's keeper? And he was all jealous because his offering, God showed no regard for it. But he did for Abel. But there was a separation. Where's Abel at? As if God didn't know. And then, then later he says, I could hear your brother's blood crying to me from the ground. But so there was a separation, not only from God when we sinned, there was a separation from each other. The fellowship had been broken. What a devastating thing. So the question is, where are we? Where are we? Um, look at, in, in, again, in your bulletin, and this is Isaiah 59, verses 1 through 2, where it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Man, that is such a good passage. Did anybody ever see the, the alligator arms? It's kind of reminding me of the guy that, was gonna, that always acts like he wants to grab the check. Oh, yeah, let me get that. Oh, I can't. I, my arms aren't quite that long. I can't quite reach it. But, but think about it. The Lord's hand's not so short that he can't save. How, many, how often we think, boy, our situation is just too much. It's just he, he, he's, he can't quite pull me through this. The Lord's hand isn't so short, but he said your sins have made a separation between you and your God. And his ears are not so dull that he can't hear your cry but it's because of our own sin that, that he, he, he can't hear us. Because so it, it's, it's not where God is. It's not the question, so where is God in this situation? I'm sure you've all heard it, and you've probably said something very similar. Where is God in all of this, all this tragedy? So where is this God of love at? The question shouldn't be, so where is God? The question should be, so where are you? Where have you gone? Adam, where are you? And so there's this, this thing. I love the old story, and it, it, it's nice when you get my age because you can tell the same old story, and you never even remember it. And most of you can't remember it either. <laughs> the same joke, and you can even change it. But... You remember the story, and it's told in different ways, but the old man and, and the lady, they, they, they're, they're, they pull up behind a, a, a truck, an old truck that's parked in front of them at the stoplight. And it, it almost looks like one head up there. There's the guy driving and the, and the lady all scooched up. Some of us are old enough to remember that when you had the bench seats and you could slide over. But then we were all rescued by the invention of bucket seats and mandatory seat belts. But, but the lovers, they would be right next to each other. And so the woman says to the man, said, remember when we used to sit like that? We used to be so close. And he says, I never moved. <laughs> you know, so she's all up against, I'm not the one who moved. 
You know, but we could, we could look at the same way with our walk with God. Man, it used to be so good. We used to walk, and I could hear the sound of you in the garden. Remember how close our relationship is. You used to call, and I used to say, here I am, Lord, send me. Always ready. But God would say, then we could say, well, where are you? Remember, it used to be so good. He said, I never moved. Where are you at? Where are you at? So what we need to do is get close with God. He never moved. He is still there. um, Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 9. Isaiah 40 and verse 9. Now this is right after the passage. And Isaiah, if you want to read some good stuff, read Isaiah right about chapter 40 to the end. There's something about that, and there's so many prophecies about the coming of the Savior and about the kingdom of God. But this passage comes right after the, um, it says there's a voice crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. And it's directly, it, it's, um, it, it's a reference to John the Baptist. Remember when they asked him, who are you? Are you the prophet? Are you Elijah? Are you the Savior? And he said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. And so it, this comes right after that passage. And it's verse 9. And it says, get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion. Bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem. Bearer of good news. Lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Last week, we pray, I, I talked about being a miner and being down in, and just digging back in the mountain and seeking and searching for God and being like a miner. Guess what now, folks? We need to be like a mountain climber. Get yourself up on a high mountain. Oh, Zion. Now, Zion, he's speaking of the church. He's speaking of of the holy city of Jerusalem, spiritually and physically. But he says, get up on the mountain. Oh, Zion, bearer of good news. Say to the cities of Judah, your God reigns. Man, this is, if anybody has good news, it's us. It's you. It's me. We have to get up. Now, I know a lot of times we're not all excited and feel like we're on the mountain, but it's like, get up. What happened? Remember the, the church where, he, where he's, um, he was speaking, I think it was in, the, in Revelations where he wrote the letters to the different churches. I think this was to Ephesus. And he talks about, oh, I, I see your good deeds. And you put to test all these false prophets. And you, find, you, you found them false and well, this and that. But he said, this one thing I have against you. You left your first love. Oh, man. Man, that's, what a terrible thing. You left your first love. But what, he, what does he say? Repent and do the deeds that you did at first. So, Francie, get back on over there. Scooch up to me. We even got a seatbelt in the middle. Don't we? No, we don't. We have a console. But But repent and do the things that you did at first. Final scripture. Man, this is your lucky day. But it's a long scripture. No. John 3, 16 and beyond. A lot of times, you know, we like to, we, we love that scripture, John three sixteen. Everybody, we could probably all quote it word for word. But what happens right after that? And what happens before it? It's always good to just, um, you know, we love that one about, you know, for who so, you know, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. You know, we love the eternal life thing, but look what he says right after that. So we'll begin with 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, 
but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the light, practices the truth, excuse me, comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Man, so I was thinking about this term, do you believe in God or believe in Jesus? And they say, whoever, if you believe in me, you'll have eternal life. What does that mean, though? If we say we believe in Jesus, does that mean that we just give intellectual assent to a fact? I believe that Jesus Christ came, that he was born of a virgin, he died, um, died on the cross, rose from the grave. Or do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe him? Man, there's a big difference. We can say, yeah, you know, like I believe that Jesus Christ existed, but do you believe it when he tells you to get up and walk? Do you believe it when he says to, you know, all of his words? What he said, he who follows me will not walk in darkness. But that, think of that scripture. He said, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. Where are you? Remember that question, where are you? Now, Jesus, the light, has come into the world. And so this, this is the judgment. He said he doesn't come to judge us if we don't believe in him. We're already judged. We are walking dead. If we have not been born again, you are already dead. You're dead spiritually. When God told Adam, the day that you eat from that fruit, you will surely die. A lot of people say, well, he lived to be 950 years old or however old he was before he physically died. But the moment he sinned, he died right on the spot. And from then on, everybody that is born, they're born dead, spiritually speaking. But so this is a judgment. He said, hey, God didn't send me, the Father didn't send the Son in to judge the world. He said, they're already judged. He said, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light. But get this, now this is how we do it. That sounded like Charles Stanley. Didn't that, isn't that what he said? Now no, hear this, now hear this. By the way, he uses the same translation that I do, the New American Standard. But, so, but listen to that one spot. He said, he who practices the truth comes to the light so his deeds will be manifested as having been wrought in God. Practicing the truth. The light, that's where the light is. So when we, we where are you? If, if we're out of touch with God, you want to get back into the light, go to the word. That's where the light is. And practice it, not just read it, practice it. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for coming into this world, Lord. Not to judge us, but to give us the light that we won't have to be away from you. When you say, where are you, Lord? Say, we're right here. We're right next to you, Lord. Father, bless this message to our heart. Bless the coming of the, the table of God, Lord. Father, that as we partake, of the bread of life, Lord, that our eyes would be open to a deeper walk with you. Lord, that we'll realize that the blood, Lord, that was shed for us, for our salvation, that will do it as often as we do it in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.